I'm JD the Media Jack, and welcome to the Flipside Podcast, episode 465. Before I get into that, I want a big thank you, shout out to my executive producer for this episode. If you want to be an executive producer, just like Red Wolf Dawn, then just go to my Patreon. Just search for the Media Jack on Patreon, and then donate as you please. Starts at $1.50 and goes up to $55. The highest tier, of course, getting yourself a shout out on an episode of the Flipside Podcast as executive producer. So again, thank you to Red Wolf Don. Now, this episode of the Flipside Podcast has the incredible voice talent. You know him from different TV shows as well as podcasts and radio shows, but you might recognize him the most as the male Commander Shepard from Mass Effect. This is Mark Mir on the Flipside Podcast. How have you been this past year and change with uh, well, the world just losing its damn mind for almost 18 months. <laughs> well, like everybody else, I've, I've had to deal with the current situation, and I've mostly done that by painting miniatures and playing Dungeons and Dragons uh, on Zoom. On Zoom? Mm-hmm. So, okay, you, you just blew my mind right away. <laughs> I, I apologize, I didn't know that you painted miniatures. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I had uh, before, of course, uh, and the thing is, one accumulates all these miniatures and never has time to paint them, and the pandemic certainly provided lots of time. <laughs> uh, so I started whittling away at the uh, big mountain of gray and white plastic that uh, I've got to get some paint on, and, you know, I did okay for a while and then got busy, and, yeah, you know, I, I've lapsed again, but I'm sure, you know, I'm sure I'll get back to it over the winter. Miniatures, uh, like the miniatures that I'm familiar with are, for me, again, I apologize for anyone who I'm possibly going to offend with this, but it's Warhammer and there's D&D, and I'm guessing you're more into the D&D. Uh, yeah, although I certainly in my collection, I've got a few Warhammer uh, miniatures that I've repurposed. You know, okay. all you really need is visual representation. And of course, funnily enough, the, the D&D that I've been playing over the last little while doesn't use miniatures because you tend to use those when you're... In person. Yeah. Uh, but so I've mostly been using the virtual tabletops, you know, Roll20 and whatnot. Right. And uh, D&D Beyond, of course, has been a great resource during all of this. And uh, yeah, so I've I've actually had a couple of campaigns that have been going almost through the entire thing. Uh, one with some folks in the UK and New Zealand and one with some friends in LA. And then subsequently, I've, I've also been guesting on a lot of people's Dungeons & Dragons streams. Uh, and I'm doing one myself, an official one, on the on the actual Dungeons and Dragons uh, YouTube and Twitch channel. I'm one of the players in the Black Dice Society, which is set in Ravenloft. And of course, uh, Wizards of the Coast recently put out a new source book for Ravenloft, so mm-hmm. it, it, that's that's been fun. And uh, Ravenloft is one of my favorite settings, so getting to play in it uh, is great. And the Dungeon Master B. Dave Walters is an excellent DM, uh, so it's really a pure joy for me to play in that campaign. Mm-hmm. Do you portray the same type of character in all these guest roles? Because you have shown up, uh, like I've, I've seen you in Twitch streams and other uh, events, uh, it's blah, 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 and Mark Mir, and like, oh, cool, right on, cool. So is it a variant of the same character you portray every single time, or do you try to oh, bring no, on a different like- role? Like, yeah, it's it's usually a variety of Dungeons & Dragons characters. I've guested in uh, D4 as a dragonborn cleric by the name of Kaiser Vex, who mm-hmm. uh, is sort of a lawful good type. Uh, funnily enough, I am also playing a lawful good cleric in uh, the Black Dice Society, but they're very different people. They're very different people. Uh, Brother Uriah is much more an Ichabod Crane type. Right. Uh, and beyond that, uh, I've played... Uh, another favorite is a chaotic neutral uh, goblin thief, uh, or sorry, bard rather, uh, named Nilbog. Uh, so I've get, used him in a few campaigns. Uh, I do tend to go to spellcasters. Yeah, uh, and really? that was you know that's always been the case with my Dungeons and Dragons player characters. Right. I tend, I tend to prefer the spellcasting classes. Yeah. Well, let's dive into the you said the Black Dice Society. Mm-hmm. Yes. What is this about, and how did this come to be? 
Uh, well, B. Dave Walters was the one who called me up. Uh, okay. Wizards of the Coast wanted him to put a show together and specifically to highlight and showcase Ravenloft and uh, the new continuity in 5th edition. And uh, it's a great it's a great group of people. Uh, Becca Scott, who uh, has been a guest at Northern FanCon, as a matter of fact, and uh, does lots of stuff on Geek and Sundry. And you may have seen her uh, most recently, and B. Dave, as a matter of fact, in the new Magic the Gathering uh, online ads, uh, which are very funny, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have uh, seen those, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. so Becca is actually our Air Genasi Barbarian. Uh, and uh, it's it's an amazing uh, group. We've got uh, Tanya DePass, uh, Cypher of Tear. We have DJ Knight. Uh, we've got Nora Ibrahim, uh, Sage Ryan. And then Becca and myself, those are the players. Mm -hmm. uh, B. Dave Walters is our dungeon master. And mm -hmm. as mentioned, it's set in Ravenloft, which, for those who don't know, is the gothic horror setting of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, all types of horror. And they've sort of specifically delineated that in the book because if you want to run a gothic horror campaign, would you like to run a more sort of Lovecraftian uh, cosmic horror campaign? Would you like right. to run. Uh, integrate like body horror, all these types of things, uh, folklore, uh, you know, like the, the the dark fae and the hags and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, we're we're basically doing a whirlwind tour of all the domains of Ravenloft with an overarching plot, and uh, I'm I'm especially pleased because. Uh, B. Dave has sort of let me in behind the DM screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> because I also play one of the main villains of the campaign, uh, Aslan Rex, who is a lich, very powerful undead sorcerer wizard, and uh, sort of the main enemy of another main villain in the campaign, uh, Strahd von Zarevich, who is sort of the archetypical Dungeons and Dragons va vampire, very, very Count Dracula, let's face it. <laughs> but also kind of like the headliner of the whole Ravenloft setting. And uh, he is portrayed by Jason Carl in our campaign, who is the storyteller on uh, another vampire role-playing game uh, stream, uh, L.A. by Night, which is very popular, uh, mm. Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, so having Jason get to play Strahd, and then of course we we shoot sort of these these we've got the game of course, but we also have these epilogues that we've shot, and it's all done over Zoom because of the pandemic. Uh, but we're we're in full costume, so you know I'm like in my undead uh, prosthetic and lich costume, and <laughs> getting to do scenes as Aslan Rex with Jason Carl as Strahd has yeah it's been a, a real highlight of a game that I've enjoyed greatly. With the black, this entire campaign that you got going on, you use like a whirlwind tour of this universe. Mm -hmm. What is it about this that just gets you the most excited? Because, like, I know you're a fan of the lore and I know you're a fan of the horror, and also, like, you are by far in. Yeah, I'm a little bit biased, but you're my, one of my favorite character actors when it comes to how you just dive into whatever role you have. Sometimes you don't even need a mask. You just portray and just take on the spirit of other people. So with this campaign that's coming up, is like what is the most exciting part of it that you either have already embraced or are looking forward to? Uh, well, as mentioned, uh, playing one of the villains, that means that Aslan has some long-reaching plans which are coming together quite nicely as a matter okay. of fact and uh, so getting to participate in this sort of collaborative storytelling which is what Dungeons and Dragons largely is all role-playing games really is yeah. collaborative storytelling with the other players and with the the game master uh, and that's that's always a thrill uh, to get to participate in. I, I just want to encapsulate the the whirlwind that it was of these past two years where everything was online. And so that means that a lot more people were accessible. Have, have there been any cast members of a campaign that you've been a part of that have surprised you in any way? Oh, uh, well, let's see. I, actually, I mean, I've, I've dungeon mastered uh, a fair bit of stuff as well. Right. And uh, so for, uh, and of course, a lot of conventions are, have for the last while been online or had like, online content. Uh, so for Wales Comic Con, I actually dungeon mastered a game uh, which was me as DM and also had uh, Mr. Derek Mears, who most recently uh, played Swamp Thing. Uh, in the series and of course like Derek does a lot of fantastic creature roles he was Jason in Friday the 13th remake uh, he did so much work on Sleepy Hollow he was Predator you know so uh, he and and a good friend of mine and a great guy and also a big nerd like me uh, so I managed to get him on board and uh, I also got uh, Lucky Yates uh, another friend oh. of mine who plays Krieger on yeah 
Yeah, and Lucky also is a D&D guy. Uh, and we had Mr. Trevor Duvall, who is the voice of Rocket Raccoon uh, on uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy cartoon. Uh, and again, old friend from Edmonton originally. Uh, so we all got together with another friend of ours, Tara Oaks, from uh, Dag's Garage Theater in Atlanta. And, uh, and actually, Tara and Derek are part of that L.A. campaign that I was telling you about. The, oh, cool. Yeah, we, we played Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, and uh, we're now doing Keep on the Borderlands. And those are both, for, they're very classic modules that a, a company uh, called Goodman Games has recently revamped for 5th edition. So, yeah, yeah getting to play Dungeons & Dragons with old friends from all over the world that's that's been you know i don't want to say a benefit of the pandemic but you know <laughs> at, least, at least there's been something good that came out of it. this is this is true being a dm uh can you recall any point or any time where the cast members have completely derailed your plans oh well the thing is when you're a dm your plans should be very very fluid. flexible and yeah, fluid, okay. uh, because uh, you know, unlike even a, a video game or things like that, the players can literally do anything. Yeah, they can do anything they imagine, yeah. uh, and so you have to be ready to accommodate that. Uh, because, as I say, it is collaborative storytelling. So, and I do a lot of improv. I'm I'm an improviser by trade, one might say. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> like trying to stick to a story when the players are clearly interested in doing something else. That's that's not going. That's not going to be productive for anyone. You have to adapt and change and and go on the journey that the players want to. Right. <laughs> I uh, I'll admit I, I've dabbled in D and D. I, I'm a late bloomer. A couple of years ago, I, I started to get into it, and I was invited to uh, be a part of a campaign. I picked a uh, a paladin, a, a neutral or a, a good. Uh, I guess good neutral is was that the. Is that the yeah? The there's Derek? there's a couple yeah, of yeah. Uh, there's yeah. Uh, good neutral <clears throat> evil and then there's also lawful neutral chaotic. Yeah, so I was good neutral, so I wasn't necessarily lawful, nor was I into breaking the law. But yeah, so you would you were neutral good. Yes, I was neutral good. Yes, mm -hmm. it was it was an absolute blast, and um, uh, it was interesting because, like, I, I felt as though being a paladin was. For me, like I, basically like a turnkey in you go type thing. But as I started playing and watching my other castmates and even the DM get into it, I realized that I had to up my game. I I had to really start to dive deeper into this character and how they would respond and you know their mannerisms and how they would rest and interact with certain characters and like it, I, I I like again I'm a late bloomer when it comes to something like this, when did you first catch the D&D &D spark? A very long time ago. Uh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the early 80s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By early, I mean like 1981 or so. So, yeah, I've been playing <laughs> since I was a little kid. Okay. Yeah, and I am thrilled that, you know, Dungeons & Dragons is so uh, pervasive now that, you know, I can pretty much play a game whenever I want. One of your most famous voice acting roles was Baldur's Gate, and it is... In, in essence, a D and D game because there is stats and oh yeah, no roll of the dice. It's actually, and, it's licensed. It's a licensed D and D property. Like it's, yeah, and that was one of my very first uh, voiceover gigs in in video games. Uh, and I think it's largely because maybe not maybe not the first uh, gig that I got with them because that was like one line at the end of Baldur's Gate two. Uh, but I subsequently got hired back for all the Dungeons and Dragons games that Bioware was doing, and I think right. it's because I wasn't. D&D &D player I knew it quite well and so I didn't need things explained to me like they could just put me in the booth and you know say this guy is a kobold shaman and I, I wouldn't be confused and uh, what's his uh, motivation yeah, like, oh, okay then I know what his alignment is I know what god he worships so you know it would yeah yeah I would uh, I would just immediately know all the background details and especially of the forgotten realms and things like yeah. that where most of the games they were doing were set mm -hmm. You, you, you hinted at uh, a career as, as an improv actor um, and uh, Dynasty, which I, I, I was doing a little bit of research into it. This utter fact that blows my mind of a 53-hour-long soapathon, zero sleep. <laughs> Are you just like a glutton for punishment? What is this? Yeah, I mean, there was, uh, that's actually a fundraiser that Dynasty does every year. Right. Uh, and it's subsequently 
spread across the world. Uh, so it's a it's it's what it sounds like. It's an improv uh, marathon, and uh, there are quite a few theater companies around the world that do something similar. But this is unique in that it's one narrative, and it's an improvised like sort of soap opera essentially. So you'll see characters come and go, and people will switch characters. But there's one sort of narrative that's going all the way through it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we started doing that back in the 90s, actually, uh, at the Varscona Theater here in Edmonton. And, uh, you know, the setting changes every year, like it's a different event or something, you know, different plot that brings every week, all these ca- various characters together. And, uh, yeah, a, a lot of people uh, do it without sleeping, a lot of the actors and people, and sometimes the technicians as well or musicians. And uh, and there's audience members, too, that try to stay up for as much of it as they can, like bring sleeping bags to the theater. Oh. And uh, as I say, it's subsequently sort of pollinated across the world because uh, there were some improvisers from the UK, good friends of ours, who started up what they called the London Improvathon. And uh, I've done ooh, about 10 of those uh, as well. And uh, there was one in Toronto, there's uh, there, you know, Australia. So yeah, it's, it's very fun. And you know, the sleep deprivation does become part of it because you really sort of just buy into the story and your character because you haven't been yourself for more than two days uh it's it's a lot of fun and you just sort of like go you know you go through the wall and you just uh, there's there's times where you just feel like you're going to collapse but yeah yeah uh having done it a bunch of times that that eventually just fades away and you you know after you've done it a few times you don't even hallucinate anymore <laughs> it's no longer a hallucination it's just the front that is it <laughs> yeah I was stunned. Uh, I follow you on social media, of course, uh, not in a weird way. Uh, I was stunned that uh, one of my favorite improv actors uh, you, you got to work with, and quite regularly, uh, Colin Mockery. Oh, yes, yeah. Colin is fantastic, and, of course, it's always a real honor and thrill to get to work with him. And, uh, you know, it ties back to Dungeons & Dragons as well, because I do a show called Improvised Dungeons & Dragons, uh, right. where... It's basically a bunch of improvisers in full costume with all their armor and weapons and everything. Uh, And I lead them through a Dungeons & Dragons adventure as the Dungeon Master. And I'm doing what the Dungeon Master would do. So I'm playing all the other characters, not just the monsters, but also like the townspeople and, you know, the king and their mentors and and all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so Colin has played that with us a number of times. He actually has a recurring character. And we've, uh, during the pandemic, we've done a few online versions of that, like shows for uh, some festivals and conventions. And uh, as a matter of fact, we did it at DragonCon last year, uh, where we spawned what they call a DragonCon cult. Uh, DragonCon attendees sort of like latch onto something that they saw at the con and, and make it a big deal. And Colin's character was playing uh, Brother Bartholomew. Or he was Brother Bartholomew, a cleric of chad the god of sensible footwear uh, so, so after we did the show at dragon con there were there was like fan art there was all this stuff it became you know on all the dragon con discords and things like that that it was it was really fun to see that embraced and hopefully you know chad shall rise again at dragon con really. <laughs> i you know what the description right there of uh uh, the cleric of sensible footwear. It, it has Colin Mockery written all over it. Oh yeah, frankly. no, Colin. Colin made up his own god. Like no kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, there the, lots of things about saving your soul and things like that. But, you know, it writes itself, really. Yeah. With, with, continuing on with like the acting and whatnot, as well as the improv, uh, you have been a major part of what I can see is three major shows in the improv world: Tiny Plastic Men. Caution may contain nuts, and I'm so, I apologize. The third one escapes me. The irrelevant show. Oh right. Uh, well, actually, like no, those weren't improv. They were comedy. Oh, and, like a lot of the material was sort of probably generated through improv, or at least ideas from it. Okay. okay. Uh, they were all, uh, or let's let's see. Irrelevant show was sketch comedy, and that ran for seven or eight seasons on CBC Radio National. Right. And then uh, Caution May Contain Nuts, that's on APTN, and uh, I think we got mm, three seasons of that. Hmm. Uh, and Caution May Contain Nuts, I'm, I'm just realizing, I think we did five seasons of that. Uh, anyway, uh, we were on APTN, that was also a sketch comedy show. And Tiny Plastic Men was actually a sitcom sketch hybrid uh, show. Right. So there was like 
an A plot essentially. It was about three guys who work as prototype testers at a struggling toy company. So they were the guys who worked in the basement and tested all the toys. And all the toys that this company produced were either very dangerous or totally unsuitable for children or uh, radioactive or possessed by demons or all of some combination of all of the above. Uh, and then there were also embedded within the show sketches. So we would sort of like throw two sketches from the A plot and go back and forth. Right. And as, let's see, we, we did like four seasons of that. And like in the later seasons, especially the sketches and the sitcom sort of started to bleed together. And you started to see characters who only existed in the sketches said like appearing in the sitcom as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, see that red mask on the wall? Behind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that was the mask of our uh, very obvious homage to Dr. Doom, uh, who was named Dr. Von Chaos. And he kind of looked like a combo of Dr. Doom and the Red Skull. And uh, he he only appeared in sketches for the first mm, season or two, I think. or the, Definitely the first season. In the second season, we started bringing in the fact that Latvania, which was, you know, the Latveria stand-in that he ruled, uh, was actually a real country in the sitcom universe. And then it went from there so that by the end, by the fourth season, he was like a character. He would just be like walking into the office. He was, <laughs> he was dating their boss. Uh, and yeah, so it was it was really fun to get to bring in a Doctor Doom homage. Yes. And uh, I'm a big Doctor Doom fan. So getting to play, you know, first of all, this very clear homage to Doctor Doom, comedy version, clearly. Mm. But uh, then to have him become part of the main plot of the sitcom, that that was really gratifying. Yeah, like I, I apologize for getting that confused, but I, 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 my only excuse is that it is a, a credit to your ability to make things that seem uh, improv. Uh, or make things that are scripted to seem improvisational. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't take it as, a, as any sort of insult. In fact, like, as I say, almost everyone in you know, the cast and the writing uh, teams of both of those shows were improvisers or, or yeah. are improvisers. And uh, a lot of, again, a lot of ideas uh, got for sketches and things like that were generated from improv or yeah. sometimes developed through the course of improv. So, yeah, there, there was definite crossover. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like uh, the biggest misconception of improvisation, improvisation, uh, I speak for a living, believe it or not. Improvisation. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest misconception of that is it takes a quick mind and nothing more. Be able to react off you go. It takes actually a lot of practice to have that sort of. Oh, yeah. When I when I started doing this, I was terrible. <laughs> took a lot of workshops and you know I'm, I might have thought I was like hey I'm pretty funny uh, and certainly at the time you know I look back on, on my early improv work and realize mm, I didn't really know much then uh, so yeah it's, I've, I've had the opportunity to go all over the world and mm -hmm. uh, train with some uh, fantastic people at uh, festivals and things like that mm -hmm. so uh, yeah improv is something that you know uh, natural talent and natural quick wittedness will help you but you do have to work on it it's it's a skill that has to be honed yeah very much so um, I, I got hooked on audiobooks throughout the pandemic uh, lost on my own thoughts not able to do much didn't want to go out didn't want to touch anything physical I mean blame my OCD for it audiobooks are just an easy way of downloading and just enjoying something different. Um, I was listening to a couple of audiobooks, a, a, a couple of biographies on Robin Williams, who is like iconic when it comes to improv. It really broke down the fact that he was constantly grinding and practicing and being thrown things, uh, scenarios and ideas and, and names and situations just so that he could have something to pull on in a moment's notice when it came to uh, being funny or something would pop up. And so like it is very much still like being quick witted and being able to respond, but it's also like the ability to go, okay, I know this scenario. I know where I can take it. It can go this direction. It feels like this direction. I'm working with these people. So it's very much like a practiced skill to be quick. It is somewhat, well, you know, essentially the mind is a muscle. And so yes. you, you kind of have to uh, to exercise that muscle. Uh, but at the same time, if you go in with like a thousand, it's like being a DM. If you go in with a thousand intricate plans into a 
improv scene, all of them will be foiled and all of them will will crumble. So in a large sense, it is about being in the moment and just allowing uh, the story to be built with you and your scene mates. Yeah. Also, you know, being able to uh, embrace the character, which, again, I've seen it firsthand. Your ability to, uh, with or without a mask, with or without a costume, you just transform yourself into something absolutely incredible. But the masks that you have, the ones that are on the wall, as well as the costumes that you have, are fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, <laughs> I am largely a collector and wearer of these things. It's usually made by talented friends of mine. The one, uh, like, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, it was Northern Fan Con, uh, myself and, uh, well, actually, I entered into the cosplay competition twice, uh, both times, not alone. But you were the super scroll. Mm-hmm. And, that, yeah. yeah, okay. The, like, the, the way that you not only took on that character, but also the way it looked, and, my God, the ability for you to stay in that character and just not collapse from heat exhaustion. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you make sacrifices. Uh, you make sacrifices. I, I, I had the advantage of, I was wearing uh, silicone masks and gloves instead, or mask and gloves instead of uh, latex. Uh, and silicone sort of, it conducts the heat away. It's, right. uh, it doesn't trap the heat like latex does. And uh, so those gloves and that, ma- that mask were made by Composite Effects. Again, they do fantastic work. Uh, friends of mine down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe the costume was made by uh, my friend Brian Parsley, who is an excellent uh, costumer as well. Yeah, it just, I, it, I, I see, I, like, I follow them on Facebook as well, and I see their stuff, and I'm just insanely jealous. <laughs> like, I just... I, I would go broke in a moment if I if I let myself go with that. Things are starting to open up again, and um, I, it, like a lot of things are are starting to get back into motion, conventions and whatnot. And you have, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I mean, you know, ask me this time next week. We'll see what the situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much it too. It's like, yeah, no. well, let's see what happens now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got I've got a lot of you know semi long range plans, but well, it's you know the last little while has taught us that yeah, well you know plan that but wait and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. come prepared. <laughs> <laughs> With that, uh, you have an event coming, or you're going to be attending an event uh, in the near future. Uh, yeah, the Fringe Festival here yes. in Edmonton, and uh, uh, and comedy festivals in general. Uh, I've done one so far. We just had a local one called the Grindstone Comedy Festival, and that was with uh, my friend Ron Peterson, uh, who used to be on Mad TV, uh, and uh, we did a show called Gordon's Big Bald Head, and uh, also an improv show. Mm-hmm. And so Ron and I and our friend Jacob, who lives in Austria, uh, we'll be getting together for the Edmonton Fringe Festival. And that will be uh, the, uh, let's see, 12th, I think, uh, starting on the 12th to the 22nd of August. And we'll basically be improvising, you know, in front of a live audience. You know, we've all done some Zoom improv and corporate shows, things like that over the course of this. But it's very nice to get back in front of an audience. Uh, We did, as I say, the Grindstone Festival. And then uh, another friend of mine, Donovan Workin, uh, and, uh, and I have a group called Atomic Improv. And uh, the same weekend, funnily enough, it never rains but it pours, uh, I'll be opening for uh, David Spade and Nikki Glazer, uh, Chelsea Handler, and uh, yeah, a bunch, bunch of other comics at a thing called the Great Outdoors Comedy Festival. That's insane. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that will be, that'll be a busy week for me. Uh, and, and it is very nice to, to be able to get back to that sort of thing. Uh, with the Fringe, they're... Definitely, despite the fact that Alberta's kind of just going, there are no more restrictions. Uh, the, the Fringe Festival itself is deciding to play it safe, so they're going to cap audiences at 60% uh, of the house, and uh, people who in the audience will, will need to be masked. Uh, but even with those restrictions, it's very nice to get back to live performance. Couldn't agree more, quite frankly. Uh, British Columbia, I mean, we've been doing wonderful, but uh, as of right now, uh, we're at the beginning of August, um, the Okanagan has started to implement or implement more 
uh, restrictions because of a sudden outbreak. So like I've, I've said this on my radio show and I've said this in person, like we're not out of the woods yet. We're making good progress, but we're just not quite there yet. No, no, no. it's uh, it's going to be a while before we see things, you know, at the way they were in 2019. <laughs> Back to normal. Mm. <laughs> um, before I let you go, and I really appreciate the time you've spent with me today, uh, I would be lynched in the streets if I did not bring up Commander Shepard. Oh, yes. Well, there was this little thing called the Mass Effect Legendary Edition that came out this year. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic just to see uh, all the love for that. Uh, the fans have been great. We've had a couple of online events. Uh, we did a couple of uh, big cast reunions, as a matter of fact. Uh, one last November uh, for N7 Day and one uh, just this past May for the launch itself. Yeah. And uh, they were they were really great panels, and and we got a lot of the cast uh, all together in a Zoom room. We were in a Zoom room, uh, but yeah. uh, it was good to see even you know everybody's faces, even if they were on little tiny squares. It, it was it was a situation, and it's something that you and I had brought up in another conversation, and it's related to another game that we're going to talk about briefly. It was a situation where uh, it was interesting for one of your castmates because Jennifer Hale was not a part of Mass Effect One. Was she oh. not? Oh, no. Jennifer was part of Mass Effect 1. She was the female Commander Shepard right from the get-go. Uh, why am I thinking that there was no female Commander Shepard in Mass Effect well, 1? Well, uh, you might be forgiven for thinking that because uh, female Shepard wasn't really featured on any of the ads or the box art or anything like that. Oh. I'm very glad to see that and, you know by the by the time three came out they'd kind of rectified that and they had both but i'm really glad to see especially for the legendary edition that they did a real push uh for female shepherd because jennifer's performance is amazing and she is one of the most prolific voice actors in north america or the world she's uh legendary as they mm -hmm. say it was always a real honor for me to get to essentially play the same role as jennifer and i think it was high time that female shepherd uh, got the or fem shep as she's called got the right. spotlight as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There, there was a question from one of my Patreon followers uh, to you uh, concerning Commander Shepherd, and it was from Don. And Don wanted to know how do you get into the mindset, the role of the commander. Well, uh, we worked on it with our directors, of course, at uh, at Bioware. And uh, we tried a lot of things out before uh, we refined it. And if you're talking about like on a day-to-day -day basis, usually I would go in, they had the art references of Commander Shepard and things like that. Uh, right. But once we'd actually got the ball rolling and we were in the recording process, uh, I would usually listen to some previous day's recordings just to make sure that my voice was, you know, my, my voice is not that far from Commander Shepard's voice, like my regular voice, Right. but uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, I was matching up correctly. And uh, yeah, that was about it. And, you know, I would just look at myself in the mirror and say, I'm Commander Shepard. No. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Put down a toothbrush. I'm Commander Shepard. Yep, done. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, with the Mass Effect series, uh, you were working uh, parallel with Jennifer Hale. But then a video game came out just a few short years ago where you got to work with Jennifer Hale, as That's well right. as you got to work with Solid Snake himself, David Hare, and that was The Long Dark. Yes, yeah, The Long Dark uh, finally gave Jennifer and I a chance to have scenes with each other. Yeah. Because rather than playing the same person, uh, we're actually playing uh, a divorced couple. And uh, so we, there's lots, it, it's actually mostly flashback scenes because The Long Dark is a survival game. And yeah. uh, our characters, are, in the course of the narrative, become separated right at the beginning. Right. Uh, and uh, so, in the narrative mode, you can. There's certain parts that you play as Jennifer, and certain parts that you play as me, and it is a very difficult game. Uh, it it doesn't have like a tutorial or anything like that. It's the entire concept is that a geomagnetic event knocks out all power on Earth, and Jennifer and my characters are in a bush plane above northern Canada when that happens. So we mm -hmm. crash, and uh, electricity doesn't exist anymore. And so it's just about trying not to freeze, uh, starve to death, get eaten by wolves. And uh, it's mostly it's mostly about gathering supplies and foraging <laughs> and, you know, uh, hunting like, and yeah. rifling, rifling through cabins for an old can of beans. And, yeah. 
it, it, so I, I downloaded the, the Long Dark after you uh, had brought it up to me a couple of years ago, and I played it. And you're right. Like, the tutorial is basically the very first five minutes of the, the main story mode, and that is it. Uh, then you can go into free mode and and just try to survive. It's one of those games where the game is trying to kill you. Period. Yeah. That is it. <laughs> I uh, I call it player versus Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It is absolutely true. And it's it's amazing because there are people like there's some very dedicated fans uh, out there, and some people have managed to survive you know more than a year in game. Yeah. And uh, it's yeah it's it's uh, quite impressive I think. Yeah. So uh, and uh, as mentioned uh, we. We have a narrative mode, and that's sort of released episodically. Uh, right. So even though the game has been out for years, there's new content always being added to it, new stuff coming out, and new narrative episodes. The narrative episode, uh, I believe it's episode... That's my dog, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, episode number four uh, will be coming out soon. Uh, I think uh, Raphael from Hinterland has already tweeted about that, so I don't think I get in trouble for saying that, but it no, is no. way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, fantastic cast as mentioned. Myself, Jennifer Hale. Like I'm great. I'm I'm in the cast. No, but yeah. uh, castmates, I should say. Uh, Jennifer Hale, uh, David Hayter, as mentioned, who is amazing and a real pleasure to work with, and a great guy, as a matter of yeah. fact. Well, and uh, also, you can look forward to Elias Tufexis, uh, who played uh, Ad, Adam Jensen uh, in Deus Ex. You may remember that. Yeah. And, Yes, uh, and also, of course, does a lot of on-camera work. He's on The Expanse. Uh, he's he's usually the gravelly-voiced villain. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, Elias has an amazing voice. And, yeah. uh, again, getting to play with uh, these friends of mine in this game. Uh, it's, it's like... It's like an 18-month-long D&D camp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought uh, Like some of the biggest stars in voice acting and video games are uh, have all come together just to survive in Canada? <laughs> uh, what else do you have coming up in the near future, Mark? Uh, well, as mentioned, we got the Fringe Festival. Yes. Uh, and once that's done, uh, I am going to Dragon Con. Again, fingers crossed. It, it looks like everything is happening, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to that because DragonCon is one of my favorite conventions. Uh, of course, uh, there will be restrictions, there'll be uh, capped attendance, and uh, I believe they've just announced, yes, there will be masks. But the thing about DragonCon is it's a very big cosplay con, so I have no doubt that cosplayers are going to be very ingenious about integrating masks into their costumes. And it'll just be good to get back because I it really, it killed me to miss it last year. Uh, and even though I did like a lot of online content for them, like several things, it, you know, I was I was pretty busy that weekend. <laughs> I, uh, but, yeah. uh, but it was all happening in my living room. Uh, so I look forward to uh, getting to experience Dragon Con in Atlanta once more. Awesome. Uh, where can people find you on social media and where would you like them to follow you on social media? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. I am Mr. Mark Mir. That's M R period Mark Mir. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have uh, unified uh, account names. So on Twitter, I am Mark underscore Mir. Mm. And of course, you can see me every Thursday on the official Dungeons and Dragons uh, YouTube and Twitch channels uh, on the Black Dice Society. That's every Thursday at, I believe, 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. And, of course, you can find me on Cameo for all your Mass Effect catchphrase-related news. <laughs> Let me guess. There's plenty of questions of, can you can you do the, the Manslayer saying, please? Oh, yes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I've, I've said we'll bang okay as, almost as much as anything that's actually in the game. So, yeah. That is awesome. Cameo. I did not know that. I, I am on Cameo. That is awesome. Thank you, Mark. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs>